so passionate about helping businesses grow and you absolutely have to market to grow your business. Give it all you got. The best is yet to come. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tiffany from OMH Agency, and I'm here with Jeff Leather this morning. Jeff, morning. thank you so much for joining us. He is the owner and publisher for Billings Lifestyle Magazine, so I'm very excited that you're with us, actually. Um, and let's see here. Uh, Jeff, he's a local entrepreneur and the owner, like I said, of uh, Billings Lifestyle Magazine, and he, which helps, uh, he likes helping small businesses um, grow. <laughs> Can I just start this over Absolutely, again? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're doing great. <laughs> okay. So this week's guest is Jeff Leather from Billings Lifestyle, and he's here to discuss budgeting for marketing. Yes. I think I just got a little too excited and ahead of myself. So um, he is a local entrepreneur and the owner and publisher of Billings Lifestyle Magazine. Uh, he likes helping small businesses grow, and um, it's been his passion his entire adult life. He received his undergraduate in business uh, marketing from MSU in Bozeman, right? Yep. Yep. Very nice. And his MBA from the University of Phoenix. He spent 14 years in sales and consulting for, for, for a Fortune 300 company prior to launching Billings Lifestyle with his wife, Anne-Marie. There Thank you, you so much for Absolutely. coming. Yeah. 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 So budgeting for marketing, I feel like that comes up so much. I've heard you speak to groups and, yeah. um, and people about it. Do you want to just kind of share a little bit? I mean, first, why don't you share a little bit about what you do and then maybe why it's important to um, even think about budgeting? Sure. Um, well, for us, we started the magazine. Um, uh, obviously, we're, we're looking to help people grow. We're looking to connect the community. But I'm looking to grow a business as well. And um, just from all my experience, educational and, and work, um, that's what I've done. I, I've really helped these businesses try to figure out why they are where they are and, and how we can impact where they want to be. And um, marketing just, it always came down to marketing, it seemed like. And so just knowing what I know in the past, I, I really am passionate about bringing that into what I'm doing today, as well as helping the local small businesses. So um, as we put this magazine out uh, in the community, um, obviously we're looking for great business partners that want to get their message out to people. And so I get the pleasure of talking to people day in and day out on what are they doing, what's working, what's not working, and trying to help them understand marketing and how to budget for that. Okay. Well, that's awesome. I'm sure that comes up a lot too um, with what you do. So um, so what are your a uh, couple of your own observations about businesses and the way that they budget or don't budget for marketing? Sure. I, I, the number one observation is um, when I walk into a business, I would say nine out of ten times, um, I'll ask them what their marketing budget is, and they look at me with a blank stare. And that's typically because they, they don't know. Either either they never um, had thought about it, they never learned how to do it, or they're just kind of, um, it, it's more reactionary versus developing something ahead of time. And so most of the time, people don't even have a budget. That's been my, my number one experience. Um, secondly, though, is those people that do have a budget, um, they break into two categories, really. And that is the people who just arbitrarily pick a number, and that is their budget, or those those people that truly come from a either a business background, they either grew up in entrepreneurship, they went to some sort of business school, or they've, they've really invested in a lot of um, continuing education on their own. And those are the folks that you you see, they've got an act for, for marketing, and they have a dedicated budget. I mean, they go through lots of um, you know strategic planning and, and they sit down they their their goals every single year include specific budgeting strategies and um, and you'll see them around town mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to pick those ones out it's it's typically the business that is within any given category that is absolutely killing it and everybody else within that industry just absolutely hates that right that top <laughs> front runner so yeah it's um so that's it, it's been a mixed bag but typically I would say nine out of ten at least nine out of 10 really don't, uh, they look at me with that blank stare. Mm -hmm. So, and isn't that interesting because like when you do, if you do a business plan, creating a budget yep. is a big part of it. And there's a whole section just for marketing budget. Yeah. So, um, but do you find that a lot of businesses do or don't have, I would say there's plans? a, there's a big lack of planning, um, across the board, you know, and, and I get stuck in that too, you're, you know, starting this business, you try to plan for everything and then you find you get, you're in the trenches and you you kind of forget to go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. And um, But I love there's a lot of resources around town. You know, you got the 
um, uh, downtown um, Billings Alliance. I mean, those folks, you can go in there and, and talk to them, Big Sky EDA. Um, there's just so many professionals that would help. I mean, I'm helping people all the time on it. When you break it down, it's it's we all know what to do. We just don't do it. It's not for a lack of knowledge. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Internet is full of wonderful information. Tutorials so, and templates. Yeah, and It's just taking the time to actually do it. Um, and that's what it comes down to is consistency and, and putting in the hard work. Mm-hmm. And um, we're located in Billings, Montana. So yeah. we do have a downtown uh, business alliance and we have... Also, the Small Business Resource Center, yes. as well as the Economic Development mm-hmm. um, Center as well. But no matter where you are in the country, they have exactly those types of things. Yeah, there should help. always and be a the, community resource that, that mm-hmm. would help with that. And usually the Small Business Resource Center, they have quite an outreach in mm-hmm. many, many communities, um, specifically for helping planning and budgeting and things like that. So. Well, you can even go just online to the U.S. Um, Small Business Association. Well, I think it's SBDA. Yeah, I yeah. think they have their own where you it, fill it in. And, and they have all, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of free resources there as well. Um, but like I say, I even know that they're there and I, I don't use those forms. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times I reinvent my own forms and, and we just keep reinventing the wheel. I'm, I'm no different than everybody else out there. It's just a matter of, I've been through, I've, I've seen it in my professional career helping other people as well as my own business. That it's just, I've made all the mistakes that you can possibly make. So I'm just trying to help people avoid the same mistakes. Well, and the nice thing is, like, we can pick. We can go, okay, I w- I'm going to spend the next few years making the same mistakes that everyone else makes. Yeah. Or, you know, take information like what you're sharing today and start 10 years ahead. Right. <laughs> you know, basically, it's like getting 10 years of education in an hour, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, do you have some suggestions? One thing that I know we hear all the time, and I'm sure you hear this a lot, too, but... Yeah where businesses um, or startups, they're cash-strapped. I mean, do you have some ideas or suggestions when it comes to a marketing budget? Uh, you know, I, I do. I, I have really two suggestions. Everybody I talk to when it comes to marketing budget is uh, there's two things that you need to do. Number one is just get started and mm-hmm. set one up. And then secondly is just be consistent with it. And um, with those two things, I mean, you're, you're just going to grow. It's, when you start looking at the numbers out there, Anyone who really puts a concerted effort into specifically marketing, now, granted, there's a thousand different ways that we can market, right? And some are better than others. But if you just get started and you start taking some calculated risks out there, the, the stats don't lie. Mm-hmm. You, you grow in business. So that's number one, as I just say, get started and be consistent. But secondly, is there's a lot of things that you can do that really do not require money. Right. It just require your time. And, and that's... Uh, just thinking about your business versus the, the competition. I mean, you can literally sit down, take take time out, start asking you know um, a spouse, uh, close friends, what they see in your business. But how do you set yourself apart from the competition? If you don't know your unique um, proposition mm-hmm. for customers, uh, it doesn't matter who you are. You're not going to be able. To, you can't sell against the competition unless you have some way that you're going to set yourself apart. So I mean, that's just really sitting down and. And hammering it out and asking some specific questions, um, such as, you know, what is your compelling message? How are you unique? I, I'm going to tell you an interesting story. I won't name names um, in, in Billings, but I I was just going around like I do. I'm, I'm meeting new people, meeting new businesses, and I'm asking them diff- just questions like, what's working, what's not working, what's your compelling message? And I don't know if it's because they saw me as a salesperson coming in there or not, um, they weren't overly friendly. And, and, and once they realized I wasn't selling them anything, I'm just trying to find out where are they? What do they do? What sets them apart? I literally heard the individual there. He was a manager there say, we don't have a competitive advantage. We have absolutely no compelling message is what he's telling me. And I thought, is this your way of just trying to get me (laughs) out of your, out of your, um, your building? I I wasn't sure. And I just, I asked him, I said, you have no, there's nothing that sets you apart. But interestingly enough, the longer we talked, the more he was talking about how long they've been in town, Mm -hmm. you know, how established that they are. Um, how the products that they get in, it's, it's just low margin. But in his mind, he thought of it as he was just a commodity-driven business. He has no value. When you really get down to it, it's like, wait a minute. You've been here longer than anybody else, mm-hmm. right? So you have that sustainability. You have been here. You back up the products that you sell. I mean, there's a, there's right. a great compelling message. So anyway, that's what I'm saying is it, a lot of people can go through their own brainstorming on that. It costs nothing. You can do that on your own. Um, I have all sorts of ideas I, I tell people about, but I mean, look on online, start, start, um, I tell people to stock their competition. 
in a very nice way, but if you're I'll trying stalk, to like stalk, a like stalker, like stalk, <laughs> like if you're trying to figure out how how you set yourself apart, um, start stalking them. I mean, you can you literally can create Google alerts on mm-hmm. businesses. Right. You find out everything that they're doing. It just pops right into your your uh, your email. Um, look at what they're doing on their website. Um, follow them on social media. I mean. I'll look at me and every one of my competitors are followers of mine on social media. Uh-huh. They haven't liked me on social okay, media, yeah. but they follow me. And it's like, <laughs> good, good on them. I, I do the exact same thing back. Yeah. And um, it, it's good because you know, you should know, hopefully, who are who are the main competitors? Who are those people that are just doing something different, unique, striving? They're, they're where you want to be um, or where you want to surpass. And it's a matter of saying, well, let's look at what they're doing. Something's working. Mm-hmm. And then we don't plagiarize them, but there's a lot of things that we can do to make sure that we're adding the equal value and then thinking about how we can overcome that and um, Mm -hmm. lots and lots more. Well, can I just say too, like when we're talking about marketing budget, I think Mm -hmm. a lot of times what happens is, is people are like, this is how much money I have to spend. Like I here's my budget. This is an expense that I need to go out. And I, I feel like there's such a different way to look at marketing than that. You know, there's a lot of ways to market. There's, um, there are ways to market that are more traditional, like what, what we're talking about that are kind of slow boat. This is kind of what we do and you want to build your brand and trust and all that. But there are also ways where you can put money into marketing and look at it like um, a cost of getting money back. You know what I mean? So yeah. if you're doing it, then, you know, and, and that's probably like a whole topic in its own self. Like what are ways to, what are marketing ways yeah. to go out and say, um, this isn't an expense for my business. This is a cost of gaining sure. a customer. What are your I, I look at that? it as, um, it's a great question. I, I actually, I'll, I'll even take you one step further. I look at it as an investment in your business. Um, every industry is different, right? And so there's some industries where if, if you're truly not throwing money out there, I mean, a ton of money out there, you're just, you're not going to be relevant and you'll, you'll miss the boat. There's other ones where you are such a unique business that you really don't have to market much because mm-hmm. you're the only one. The only player. But at the end of the day, it's a matter of or what are you doing to invest in your business? Because if you break it down, so some of the tidbits that I talk to people about, some of the questions I'll throw at people, and they just look at you just crazy, is I just ask them, what does what does an average customer spend? And I start breaking down, what what is a customer worth to you? And I don't mean to like break it down to just value. stats. Kind of yeah, like, mm-hmm. But it is a matter of, yeah, you want to build relationships and you love your customers. I get it. But in business, in and of, in and of itself... A brand new customer comes in. What do they spend the very first time? Do they repeatedly purchase? So then you look at over the entire course of that year, what do they spend? How long are they with you? Mm -hmm. So if I need to invest, um, and that's where I'm getting to, is you you can break it down to how much do I invest per customer that comes in? Mm -hmm. Because then you really find out what's a true return on investment. Where is this business growing versus it cost me X number of dollars for this many run rates and, and uh, what was my reach and frequency and all the things that we hear about in marketing. It's like, those are all great. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, how much are people spending with you? Are they repeated? How long is that lifetime value? So if you spent $1,000 over the course of X number of time for a customer that ends up spending $20,000 with you over the life of that, the return there is mm-hmm. absolutely amazing. Exactly. And if you're not looking that far down the line, you're just, you're kind of missing the boat. It's not quite as transactional as people think, I think yeah. is kind of another way to put it. For sure. Where it's like, you know, you're not going to put $10 in and get $50 that day. You know, I mean, it's right. not like a, a yeah. cash machine or something, but it is something that you want to look at long term. One, marketing takes a while, but kind of breaking those dollars down to say how much does it cost to acquire a customer. Right. And then in turn, once you've put that money in and you know, these are how many customers I get out of this much money that I put in, yeah. how much, um, what is what you're saying, the lifetime value of a customer. So, you know, where you might, let's take Billings Lifestyle, for example, you know, you might have a client that, you know, you can figure out the average length, you know, of time that they advertise with you and the average amount and, and reverse that and be able to know, well, if it costs this much to bring in the customer and then this is their lifetime value, then you get to see what your return is right. on your marketing. Is that? No, absolutely. You nailed it. Yeah, that's. I think that's um, one of the things when we when I start looking at the way I figure numbers anyway. Um, is I don't have a calculator that says I I spend X number of dollars and this much was returned within this specific month. I granted those are great things to track, but I'm doing it exactly like you are. It's a matter of um, I think as a society we're so um, 
um, driven based on immediate needs and, and instant gratification and what can we track instantaneously mm-hmm. that we lose lose sight of the overall picture. I, <clears throat> I look at a, a marketing budget or your business as kind of like a um, um, health or a membership at a gym, right? So just because you have your business, right? It's just like, okay, you have, here's your membership to the gym. Now, it doesn't mean that your business is going to do anything or that your body's going to change at all. A gym analogy. Right. I talk a lot of analogies. That's, that's awesome. So but pictures, when you do it that way, it's a matter of if you continually have to show up and invest in it. Now, you might not see the, the daily changes within weight or whatever you're tracking. But when you look down the line, when you consistently stay with it, you're going to see dramatic results. And the same thing happens in business. Right. And it, it happens over and over. The numbers don't lie. Mm-hmm. It's just hard to get people to really. That's the number one challenge, I would say, with every customer that that I have personally within Billings Lifestyle or that I've helped customers in the past. The company I worked with before, that's primarily 90% of my job is going in and really looking at efficiencies and how can we help them. And I can, without a doubt, tell you that is it's not even the 80 20 rule. It's more of the 95, five rule. 5% of the people just really got it. They stuck with it. And if you look at where they are today versus where they were when I, when we first started talking 10, you know, 14 years ago, night and day. Mm-hmm. And those are the same customers. Now, when I talk to the other ones, they say, oh, gosh, how are they doing it? I really don't get how they're doing it. It's no different than it was when we first started talking. The difference is they stuck with something and now it's, you know, 10 years down the road. Right. Right. So. Well, so how do you recommend that a business sit down and calculate, like, how much should we spend? Because I hear this yeah. a lot, and it, it comes from people who just start businesses or are thinking about starting a business, but it also comes from people in business for a long time. And um, so how, do you have some kind of way that – I know for a lot of things in marketing, we have to kind of start and then track mm-hmm. and then adjust. But, like, if we're just starting, like, where, what would be a good starting point? No, that's an awesome question because um, there's so many variables in it that um, you can look at every the stats that are out there. And, and I had a bunch of stats I wrote them down here that I brought. But it's like if you start looking at um, specific um, uh, agencies, <coughs> there, so the, the U.S. Small Small Business uh, Association will tell you, hey, you need to invest between you know eight and ten percent. And you always hear this rule of tens. So, oh, it's ten percent. You got to invest ten percent. Um, my thought is there's so many variables that are going to screw you up that you're going to really sit there and analyze this analysis to paralysis type mm-hmm. thing. Um, my thought is get started. If you can just get started and really use the, the, the law of invest 10% of your revenues into marketing, that's a great place to start. Mm-hmm. From that point, you can adjust based on some things, right? And so um, and it varies, you know, you can, so it's just some stats. For example, um, if you go to, again, to the, US, the Small Business Alliance um, or Small Business Association, they'll tell you that the startups should invest 2 to 3% of their, of their gross. And then you look at like a study that was done by Iowa State University, I believe. They said, no, based on what they saw, tw- you should invest 20 to 30%. I mean, I don't know if you're seeing the big differences yeah, in the numbers. So huge. it's kind of like it all depends on who you ask and what industry they're in. Um, but when you break it all down, when they start analyzing like companies, um, that are five five million dollars and under, and you start looking at what are they investing? They're investing anywhere from around that six percent up to that fifteen percent. Just just go right down the middle. I say do ten percent. Start there. You're going to be better off for it, and then start tracking from that. Um, I, I sorry, my mind just goes hundred miles an hour. But then it's a matter of but you got to track it. So you really need to start identifying a system on how are you going to track how well your marketing is doing mm-hmm. over time. And again, you don't want to pull out of something within a month. You got to give it time. And so there's so many different ways to track that as well. Yeah. But I just say you sit down and start. If you can start uh, a 10% grade, if you can't start there, you're, like, you're literally whatever, overexposed on how much you're paying for rent. Or, you know, you look at all these different things for overhead that are eating up your cash. If that's mm-hmm. where you are, okay. So changes need to be made at some point, but let's get started on your budget. Because that's the only way we we're driving new revenue into that, that practice. And, so, and it's probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of fair to say that be as aggressive as you can tolerate because you know if you're if you want to grow you have to put more either time or money so right. if if you're at two percent well then get ready and buckle up you're gonna yep. have to spend you know 60 percent of your time on marketing then because yep. you're not paying it you're not paying for it so you're right. trading it's a trade-off and you can't That's a very good point yes. you can't grow without some especially starting out you know you need some um, I don't know. My feeling is always like be as aggressive as you can be, as yeah. aggressive as you can tolerate, 
um, but don't ignore it. You need to right. be really deliberate and looking at it and going, I am choosing not to spend 10, you know, and even at 10%, you were giving some stats earlier about scaling and like, yeah. um, and which you can share here, but, um, you know, just knowing as a business owner, you have to know that if you do not put the money in, you will have to put the time in mm-hmm. or you will go out of business. No, that's a good point because the time, if you think about it, the time is still invested into it. And that, that's your um, opportunity cost, if you will. Because um, so I ran into this um, in, in dealing with a lot of um, employers and in in, in for 14 years as I was coming in and consulting folks. And you could break it down, and let's just say the owner's time was worth about four hundred dollars an hour, and that's not to say he's pocketing four hundred dollars of cash per hour, but it's four hundred dollars per hour, and that goes right back into the overall business. If that's what his time can be valued at for new customers coming in, and that individual is spending all their time doing their own marketing and some of these these things that, so we just broke it down. I thought, wait, can you outsource some of this stuff? Because you you outsource it for pennies on the dollar in a way, and, and so it's cheaper to outsource some of these things than it is to actually even hire an employee. You can hire an employee at $10 an hour. Mm-hmm. Your time's worth $400. You can hire an employee at $10 an hour and it would still cost you a small fortune for that employee compared to what you can do outsourcing it. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, that's where I'm saying a lot of times we get stuck in our own businesses and we're not going back to almost like marketing 101 or business 101 where it's like, okay, let's just sit back for a second and realize what are we doing in our business? Are we truly being the most effective with our time? And so that, it's a great point. If you're going to sit there and invest your time in it, well, guess what? There is an opportunity cost that you just mm-hmm. incurred. And that is, uh, you know, with some folks up to four, five, six hundred dollars $600 an hour. And so um, let's get them doing that and bringing that money into the, and then outsource some of these other things. Right. So I think, I'd, you know, addressing that. And then, yeah, for the scaling side of it, it is crazy. So um, if you start just looking at, so what I did, um, and I, I continue to do, but when you and I were talking about me coming in here to visit, I thought, you know, let's just take a look at some stats that are out there like right now. And um, I just jumped on a, there's a, a study that was done on a number of um, chief marketing officers, all publicly traded companies. And there's, I think it was just under 200 public, publicly traded companies. A number of them that are going to be well known, a number of them that are, you know, I, you won't know unless you're in the industry. But it was, um, so here are some of the stats, is as this thing scales up, so those individuals that invested 50% of revenues, 50%. So that's, that's a ton. I understand that. Mm-hmm. But if they invested 50%, their um, ret- returns were be- between 31 and 100%. Oh, geez. Year over year over year. And now the actual average was, where did I put that? 60 some percent. 60, it was only 65% was the actual average. So those folks that put... Um, um, 52% of their marketing, 50% of the revenue in a marketing uh, average uh, return was about 65%. The companies that put in an average of 22% of their marketing returned about 20%. And those companies that um, put about um, 16% into their marketing returned uh, only 7%. Now, oh, when we say only, it's still they're returning 7% on multi-million dollar companies. So, I mean, they are growing. And again, you know, industry, industry plays a role. If you're in a very, very competitive industry, I mean, you may have to pump 20, 30, 40% in just to, you know, get any visible returns. Mm-hmm. And it's just, uh, right. it all comes down to the, the business, yeah, the business that you're in. But yeah, it is scalable. And if you look at the numbers, um, they do that across all industries. If you are smart with where you're investing, again, I go back to investing, investing money back into your business in, in the form of marketing, um, the more you invest, the more you return. Right, right. Okay. So, so kind of back to the budget as much as you can tolerate. Absolutely, because you'll yeah. see the growth yeah. um, in a scalable way. Yes. So that's awesome. Those are really good examples. <clears throat> so do you have some strategy ideas about how to allocate the marketing dollars? Um, maybe use some examples. Because I know a lot of people mm-hmm. struggle with, um, you know, I know you do print advertising, which yep. is one of the reasons I was really excited to bring you in because it's really easy for all of us digital marketing people to talk about digital marketing. Sure. And so it's really nice to get your feedback because I feel like, um, you know, we're all about all the marketing pieces working really well together. Absolutely, and yeah. I love your magazine. <laughs> so yeah. I feel like it's a really relevant way. And all my friends love your magazine. And so um, I know your market that is getting these magazines and it's there's it's a really valuable way to market so all these people who are like oh sure. get rid of everything and just go completely digital i don't really agree with that um but do you have some ideas on how to allocate 
uh, marketing dollars. That's something I feel like businesses, especially small businesses, struggle with. Yeah. I have all sorts of ideas. And again, it comes down to industry. Um, so thank you for your kind words on the magazine. But um, the magazine itself, when we looked at starting this, it was very, there was very specific reasons we looked at this and it was based on um, who the, the target demographic is, um, what kind of, you know, value that, that can be provided within this specific niche um, a magazine that we do. So when I look at that, for example, on my, my side of things, when I'm going and visiting with, with businesses, um, I'm already pre-selecting in my mind um, who actually fits what I'm doing, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So, mm-hmm. so for example, um, if I were going in to talk to um, any small business um, within Billings, there's, there's going to be a great percentage of them that actually don't fit what I'm doing, and I, and I wouldn't recommend that they would be in a product such as mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, if it's a commodity-driven business, a very low... Um, uh, type of markup business low priced items things of that nature um, probably in, I would have a different advice for them on where they should allocate money versus folks that are offering the higher value products um, mm-hmm. the very unique you know have a, a very unique um, proposition for, for customers but um, if you look at it like they still have other print avenues that they could do Absolutely. like it wouldn't really fit yours so t- I mean is there some is there a magic formula <laughs> where they should go <laughs> or again kind of back to the um where do we start? Like, how would you suggest? Again, I, sure. I totally feel you on the different industries. It's going to be different. Mm-hmm. You know, um, for example, I would argue that someone in my industry should probably do more print because it means people aren't doing their online. Yeah. Like they're not online. And so, I mean, if sure. just looking in general, talking to small businesses talk, and mid-sized businesses, even I've talked to several, they're same thing. They're like, you know, I, you know, have the newspaper, I have mm-hmm. the yellow pages, and now I'm moving more into digital and everybody, all my friends are telling me that I should put everything into digital. Yeah. So if you, and I know that you walk in kind of like we do when we look at kind of holistic marketing and yeah. we're giving ideas on how to move the money around a little bit so that we're maximizing and optimizing the different avenues that are available. What are some things that you found yourself telling business owners and decision sure. makers as far as like how to allocate. Yeah, I, I think um, this so, so much was in that question. And it, <laughs> what I'll do is I'll break it down to to a couple of things that the questions that I have initially when I walk into, I guess anybody is, um, I want to know, I do want to know a little bit about um, their, their value proposition and their, their competitive um, nature of their industry because I don't know that. So I, I don't mean to bring industry back into it, but I will mm-hmm. find out specifically because I don't know if it's a very, very competitive landscape. Now there's, it's a matter of how do you set yourself apart? So, mm-hmm. I mean, I have that. But then the other is um, I really want to know who your target audience is. I, I really, and interestingly enough, a lot of people don't know that answer. You'll go in and say, what, who is your, um, who's your, who's your tar- target uh, client? Who's your target demographic? And they'll say, everybody, you know, and right. I'm like, I get you. I'd love Anybody everybody. with skin. I'd love Anyone everybody with to hair. buy my stuff too. Anyone yeah. with yeah. <laughs> But if you, if you bring it down and start asking the question more like, okay, I, I get that, but it, who is your ideal? Mm-hmm. Like if you're to break it down, strip the whole thing down and say, who is the ideal um, client? Uh, and now you just get the wheel spinning a little bit. And once you identify that ideal client, now we can break it down a little bit further. Mm-hmm. But it typically comes down to um, their, their branding. So number one, uh, um, I'll sit there and look at what is their, their branding. So again, depending on their target audience, it's, um, are you very recognizable? Have we created a specific um, brand identity, if you will? Mm-hmm. And some people, you can invest a ton into certain aspects of this, but it, your brand identity, because no matter what you do, I believe you need to be in multiple places. Your, your message has to be in multiple places because um, it just statistically shows that you have to be seen. It's the <laughs> law, what is it, the rule of sevens. And that's you learn that back in marketing school, and it hasn't changed in the mm-hmm. last 30 years. And that is... Uh, they'll tell you, you have to, your customer has to visibly see you the same exact message mm-hmm. seven times before they ever remember it. Well, that's not in just one avenue. That can be in multiple avenues. Okay. So then it comes down to, um, you don't want to confuse your audience. And so it's got to look the same. So if you haven't come up with a specific logo, specific color scheme, specific fonts that you're going to be using, you know, you know typeface, mm-hmm. if you haven't done a lot of that stuff, which most people I talk to haven't, mm-hmm. um, their eyes are just open up like, great, how much is this going to cost me? And, and really, it doesn't have to cost a whole lot. It's just a matter of being uniform across all these platforms. So number and one, it goes beyond way. confusion, too. It goes to trust. Like, yeah, if, if they see a different message in different yeah. places, they're like, so who are you, really? And 
if they don't trust you, it's pretty tough for them to yeah. hire you or purchase your products. So I think I've told you, I, I go back to you a lot of times. I, I'll say, look at the franchise model. Um, for example, Best Buy. You walk into Best Buy here versus anywhere else in the country, they all look the exact same. You walk in, the branding on the outside looks the exact same. When you walk in, the layout looks the exact same. Why? Trust. Mm -hmm. If I walk into the one here and things work the certain way, I know that if I walk in anywhere else, it's going to work that way too. Mm -hmm. And even though we're, I, I work with small businesses locally, that's mm -hmm. my primary business. That's what I've done my entire career. It's, so it's like small business they can compete on that level, not necessarily size-wise, but when it comes to overall brand um, image. And mm -hmm. so, number one, that's where I'll say, okay. spend some money on that. Um, make sure that you've really identified where you need to be there. And then it can go so many different places, but I can tell you for me and what I do, so we'll put out a, a very upscale magazine that goes out to a specific reader demographic. I gotta tell you, they have to see the branding has to be there. But then secondly is, you do whatever message that you're going to present to them. There's so many ways that we can create this call to action to get them to come in. But really what we're going to be doing is they might look at it. You're trying to be top of mind. You, you want to net, maybe move them to some more information, right? Mm -hmm. If you're on print, we're using really cool, big images and things like that. So I talk to people and say, well, where's your back end infrastructure? Everybody needs um, a website. Now, I don't, you may argue with me on that. Maybe we don't see, you know, some, some people will say, some website. people will say. Life's too short for a bad yeah. website yeah. too. Just, you know, some people will say, all you need is a Facebook page. And I'm thinking, no, that's, mm, no, that's not true because. It's a then so, what moment, right. you know. So I think, I think everybody needs a website. Um, depending again, who your target demographic is. If you're trying to hit more of those people who are in the affluent demographic or, or those people that are in the middle to upper income levels, if they go to a website that looks like it was created by some sort of templated website from the 80s, you lost them. Mm -hmm. You literally lost them at that point mm -hmm. because, again, it goes back to the trust. So so um, you need a good website. And then um, I also I think people need to be relevant in social media and at least have a dialogue with their with their customers. And, again, they can use awesome services like yours. That's what we decided to do. Again, because my time is more valuable for me to go out and do what I do and rely on professionals. But I'll tell people if, if you can't get there yet, it's like, great, okay, develop your brand, at least come up with – I should back, backtrack this. I have a lot of people who developed their own logos. They did. A family member did. Mm -hmm. A friend of a family did. <laughs> you have the and, best stories about people making logos. Oh, my their gosh. Logos. So I'm just going to tell you this, this little story that I use everywhere. It's, it's, tr it's, it's so true. But, okay, in the, in the dental industry, there was, there was this logo, and it was this tooth with this drill going into the side of it. So everyone... Close your eyes and imagine. Yes. You're Close trying your eyes to figure imagine. out. You're driving First around of all, thinking you've out. talked yourself into finally <laughs> going to the dentist. <laughs> it was like, wait a minute. i got to take time out of my day to go to somewhere where I, I have perceived that it's going to be painful, right? It's not necessarily painful anymore. But it's like you perceive it's painful. It's time out of your day. And you're, you're looking for a, a great dentist. And you see this tooth with a drill going inside <laughs> of it. But my thought is it's probably, I get it. I readily identify that it's a, it's a dental practice mm -hmm. the the issue there is it readily identifies with the <laughs> patient that is it's gonna hurt right and so that's Caps probably into actually feeling best. and emotion which is yeah. really powerful yes but um not in a good way i mean the one time where i'm like all um, pr is not good pr yeah. <laughs> so but i i remember visiting with them and it's like how do you you want to say it nicely because it was someone very close to them that mm -hmm. developed the, the logo and and you want to let them know your logo is not helping your business out. Right. And so they have changed it since then. And, and um, but there's so many things that go into that. I start thinking, again, in the dental world, they, they you'd typically see Dr. So-and-so DDS or whatever as their, the, the name of their business, something, okay, wait, let's talk about branding on that too. And, and so that's a whole nother subject in branding, but it's like, what does your brand say about you? Can you scale up your brand and, and can you eventually walk away from, and uh, you're able to actually sell a viable business that's running under a, a specific brand versus your name. Anyway, so we did um, a lot of that. Um, I, I've done a lot of marketing work with folks, and I just say it comes down to have a have a logo that, um, or a mark, or, or some color scheme, or whatever it happens to be that really speaks to who you are, what you do, your audience that they're going to, and then just make sure it's the same across all platforms. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that you have the website because you're going to want to be driving people to that website for more information, or even on there to start capturing some some specific information so you can follow up because. This marketing all comes down to generating leads, and so you're trying to generate the leads and eventually capture those leads and eventually be able to follow up and close on those leads. And, and I can't do all those things for you. I can give you suggestions, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, um, I can't 
sell it for you. You know what I mean? So it's like there's all these things that need to be put in place. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you look at a budget, overall budget, my thought is do, I just tell people to start at 10%. That's where I think is a great place to start. We can scale it up or down and we can look at things um, after that. But then you're right. It's like, what do I do with that 10%? Make sure that you're specifically build that infrastructure, build that foundation, if you will. Because once you do now, when we reach out to somebody and it's a new lead that comes in, we don't lose them out the back door. Mm -hmm. They come in they're satisfied with everything they have that level of trust and so um, there's a, so many different ways that we can do it it all comes down to again is that who is getting to your specific then it does come down to reach and frequency who how are you getting to your specific demographic mm-hmm. in the repeated number of times consistently and can i just say to you this is so funny because um you know i am for chat and grow one of the things that we mm-hmm. do is we bring in pros that I just think are amazing and ask all these questions. Oh, and Alex does our sound. Alex Youngren, my yeah. son, but he is amazing sound guy. And he is sitting here probably smiling when you brought up, you have to know your target audience because there is not one single yeah. marketing person who enters these doors that does not go, please, you know, for Christmas, for your marketing person, say, I've... I've developed my target audience. Merry yeah. Christmas, marketing yeah. person, <laughs> because yeah. it's so true. And so I think when it comes down to budget, again, looking at if you looked at, say, your favorite customer and you were to want to go find 50 more of them, mm-hmm. where do they go? Yeah, are they online? And I'm a math person. I'm very left brain. So I, I would be thinking, are they on the Internet 60 percent of the time? And then they pick up a magazine every once in a while. And that's another, you know, I would be yeah. wanting to know what's their habits and what does their plate look like? And yeah. my marketing plate should look really similar to their experiential plate, you know? Right. So, um, my but like you and I talked about, and that's, goes back to when you were saying early on, like what can somebody do that doesn't have a, a very big budget or no budget right now? Everything you just talked about there is okay. If you know your target audience, that's a number one. If you don't know who they are how in the world, can you even right. find out how to reach them? But if you know who they are now, and you and I have sat and talked about this many times, um, even me, I, this, we're talking marketing all the time mm-hmm. and I'll come up to you and say, Oh, here's a challenge that I have. And then, um, an idea that you had the other day was for me to, to do a focus group and, and really start talking to specific readers in my demographic. And I was like, Oh yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. Oh, actually, how, ask how did them? I miss that? It's like, wait, <laughs> yeah. should I talk to them? And well, you can do that. It doesn't necessarily cost you much or it's a very right. nominal fee to, to reach out to other people. And, and I run into that a lot too, is, um, even though the logo illustration that I was talking about before, it's, it's somebody very close to you. It's close to their heart. They say, we're just going to do this. And you fall in love with it because it was, you think it, it's everything that your customers want to see, but you haven't asked your customers. Right. And so if you have no idea what your customers want and yet you just roll with it, you're, it's, it's all happen. Um, uh, it's all going to happen by chance. And, mm-hmm. I, and what I found inter- interestingly enough is I, I find that's what happens and has happened with my career for the entire um, 10 years since college is, is the businesses that I go and talk to like I say, nine out of 10 look at you with the deer in the headlights. Like, I don't even know what a, I've never budgeted. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, how are you still in business in a way? Right. Um, because I mean, statistically, and I, I love numbers too, but statistically it's like 12% of your community is literally leaving every single year. It's like mm-hmm. after seven years, you completely have a brand new group of people in a way. Right. And now granted you can overcome that in certain ways, but it's like, that's happening. You get new people moving into your town all the time. And it's like, and you've just sat here relying on, current customers and hopefully word of mouth. And that's great. I think word of mouth is awesome and we can build on referrals and have all sorts of, Which a whole is other also subject. marketing. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. So, you know, and so, um, but yeah, just anyway. So, um, what I say is, uh, I guess I have just lost my train of thought, but it's, it's until you know who your target demographic is, um, you can't really do much. And then once you do find out who it is, man, there's so much that you can do. That's not going to cost you a whole lot of money. It'll just cost you time to at least get the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. So, Okay, and so I just want to open it up to, if you are listening to us live right now, we are open for questions. I know I just kind of went on and on and had my own agenda that I was pushing, Um, but if you're listening live, please do feel free to submit your questions on the chat. And um, speaking of pushing agenda, you were talking about the logos and how we put things out there, and we assume that that's what our audience wants. I feel like, um, and I talk about this a lot where I feel like, as a business, you, it's so you have to take it personally if you're going to, I feel, this is my own opinion, but I feel like you have to really take it personally to do a good job. And I feel like sometimes that, the bad, not bad, but like the other side of that coin is that we have an agenda that we're trying to push. And we fight this in marketing and content and things all the time where 
you know, we're always saying, you know, speak to your audience. Um, if you, as a business owner, because we're so passionate about what we're doing, yeah. we have an agenda that we want to push. And I feel like that goes right to logos and everything. It's like, this is the image. And we do have to have some kind of vision of that. Sure. Oh, yeah. But on the other hand, again, it's like it how it's received is also important. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's from two. Well, I guess I, I take that two separate ways. And that is... Um, this is this is just for me personally. When I walked into any number of, of businesses and you start talking to them, I, I literally have this deep passion of wanting to help somebody. So you start hearing things that are going on with them. It's like I want to help, and not only do I want to help, but I know how to help. Like mm-hmm. I've seen it; it's documented. It works over and over and over. If if you'll just listen to me, but it's the same thing I run into with my kids, where you're sitting there going, "You don't want to do this. Trust me, you don't want to." I've I've done that, and it doesn't work out very well for you, and they, and they don't want to listen to you because it's. It, you're lecturing to them more right. or you're, you're, you're telling them what they should do versus really listening to them. So from a professional standpoint, it's hard. Um, you do have to sit there and ask a lot of questions, find out really where are they at on the whole scheme of things. And a lot of times people, it's embarrassing to have to literally lift up the hood and say, here's what it looks like. You know, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't done those things. So, so you have to ask the right questions on that. Um, on the, on the flip side, another way to take that is just what you're saying, talking to somebody, the owner, they are passionate about, specifically how they want to be seen out there as well. And I think it's trying to really bridge that gap to understand what are they, what are they truly trying to have happen? But that's where I see that's where you start talking to your true customers. You, see, you need to get their perspective on it because um, brand image, like truly brand image is, is not, you can help try to guide that, but it's really what your customers say about you. Mm. It's not what you say about your own brand. Mm-hmm. You can say, this is exactly who I am and, and you have a mission and, and a vision and, and all those things that, that we talked about um, uh, recently is you can have all those things set up, but if you're not living it out and they're not seeing that, that's not how they view you. Yeah. Who's right. I mean, at the end of the day, who's right. Yeah. Your, your customer is going to really determine how they perceive it as their reality. So, right. And that I just address oh, everything. Oh yeah. Talking, yeah. No, that's great. Like, don't radical. Well, and just real quick, I know we just have a few minutes left and I have just a, a couple more questions. Mm-hmm. One is, um, do you see, like, can you just share a little bit about the difference between a sales budget and a marketing budget? Um, yeah, so if, if you're trying to develop, well, there's so many different budgets that you can have within there. So um, if you're trying to specifically brand or market or you have an advertising type campaign, um, you, you're going to have a budget for that. Uh, but then if you're also trying to g- generate specific um, sales or generate, say, specific cash flow um, for a given period of time, you're going to have a potentially separate budget for that. And so as you break down your budget, and that's one of the things when I when I talk about, you need to make sure that you, you budget aside, depending on the expert that you talk to out there in the marketing world, is if you say 10% of that goes to budget, that actually 10% of your overall revenue now can be broken out realistically between so many different avenues, um, all the way from what are you going to run for a specific um advertising campaign that's getting your branding out there per se to um, some sort of a campaign that's going to uh, be with regards to events that you're going to be putting on or trade shows or um, other promotional items like that um, to, to specifically generate uh, awareness or cash flow during those specific times. Mm. Okay. Nice. I think sometimes people think it's the same thing. And I think that sales and marketing are too yeah, no. different. I mean, sometimes you have to budget together, but again, I feel like marketing is more long-term, you know, it's more of the ship, you know, that yeah. is going through. And then the sales is more transactional. It's more like someone's getting out there, you know, sales is just um, a lot more transactional. No, and it is when I look at um, so you look at some specific campaigns. I'm just trying to think of one right off the top of my head. Like um, I don't know why it popped in my head, but you look at the uh, I think it was Wendy's years ago that said the Where's the beef? The Where's the beef? Um, you know what I'm talking about? The Where's oh, the beef 100%. campaign? Or uh, you're in good hands. With <laughs> Wait, Alex, Alper. do you know? Because yeah. I feel like I want to make sure we're hitting everybody. I gotta hit, make sure I hit a little younger demographic. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they'll know what I'm talking about. But or you have like um, you're in good hands with Allstate, or you've got just. Okay, so somebody comes up with, they're trying to have a specific way that they set themselves apart, some sort of a tagline or some sort of whatever it is. Um, when they do that, you're looking at this extremely long-term play. And so um, it's been repeated for over and over. Energizer, the bunny, that they've done that mm-hmm. over and over and over and over. 
And what that is, is that's more of an, an advertising campaign that's long, long lasting. Um, whereas let's just say, um, I can't even think of specifically when they'd be doing it, but they're trying to run some sort of a sales budget to literally generate short-term cash flow. That's going to come from a completely separate place. It's a whole different strategy, but they do need to coincide and continually run. So you have your advertising campaign going. Um, now it's, I mean, it's a great question, but when we look at that and people are trying to figure out what do I do for budgeting and you sit there and say, well, we need a marketing budget. What I typically see anyway is set aside X amount of gross sale. I just obviously just take your gross sales or your gross revenue, um, figure a percentage on that. And um, I just, I like the 10% because at least gives you something to start with. Because I think mm-hmm. people trying to figure it out for so long, they just never get started. So just start with 10%. Within that um, ad budget, I think I typically see they're going to be doing, they're going to be splitting that out between an advertising budget and a sales budget. That doesn't mean that you can't increase that. You see some of these businesses we talked about, they've got, 50 plus percent going mm-hmm. into it now they've got bigger numbers that they're able to use but i think um from the startup when you initially get out there and you're trying to really really make a, a push all the way to the business that's been out for years and years and years um you're still gonna have a minimum of 10 percent out there and i think you're still gonna be using a portion of that for both does that make sense yeah so and can you I have just different goals too, with each that just made me think and i thought about this earlier too is when you're just starting out your revenue is zero Like you don't have anything. And when my husband and I were really successful in real estate and when that happened, there's a very definite line of demarcation between when we were just starting and struggling and Mm -hmm. feeling like, are we ever going to make it at this thing? And then we made a decision. Um, We also invested in real estate. So we had some capital to invest in our own real estate endeavors. And so we just decided where do, what do we want our revenue to be next year? And that's what yeah. we put into marketing. And we did that yeah. every year. We didn't put the current year's uh, revenue as a basis. We did what we want it to be, and then yeah. we put 10% of that I into like that. It, so. And I think, and I've had that question come up uh, a lot of times, too, where if somebody says, I don't know, I mean, we're, we're pretty new. Um, I sit there and say, it's, I don't want to say it's an exact science at all. It's a matter mm-hmm. of you, you, you're always going to put out there um, estimations that you, that you think or goals that you want to hit. Um, and for some people too, they're, they're thinking, I have no idea what I'm, I'm a brand new startup. There's a lot of in- industry information you can get out there to help with that, right? You want to make an educated guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but once you set a budget, so why I like it being a part of your overall revenue is because revenue can fluctuate, mm-hmm. which means your budget can fluctuate, fluctuate. Right. So you're not stuck. I, I'm absolutely against somebody saying, I'm only going to put X number of dollars a month in for the rest. Now, this is better than nothing, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But it's like, if I put an X number of dollars in every single month, it's like, well, you're not, you're not planning to scale or adjust with what the, what the market's doing, mm-hmm. you know, your current market. And so, but one of the things you can do too as a startup is, here's my, my goal. And you track it every month. You're able to see where your revenues are, be able to track how much are you spending based on those revenues. And you, you can adjust. That's the yeah. magic of it. You can adjust anytime you need to. So before we go, is there anything else that you feel like you would really like business owners or decision makers to know with regards to budgeting and marketing? Hmm. I would say statistically, I love it. I wish I had some graphs here I could show you guys. (laughs) I would just say um, the hardest thing um, once we get a budget, people figure out that they, they need a budget and should do a budget. The hardest thing for people to really understand is consistency. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just re-hit that again is um, consistency and that repetitiveness and marketing is is actually the thing that's going to set you apart. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at the numbers, um, and I had a quote from from somebody too that basically talks about a single ad. Anyway, a single ad, regardless how great and creative it is, typically is not going to lead to a sale. Mm -hmm. It just, that's not what happens. Regardless if it's an ad in the magazine, an ad online, an ad wherever. um, You have less than 2% of any sales ever occur within that first amazing ad that's out there. Um, however, you're going to see once you get out between the seventh and 12th uh, time that you run that exact same ad and campaign, you're going to have about 80% of your sales happen then. So that's the number one thing I just think for people is just, it is like a gym membership. It is like working out. It is this consistent effort over time and it works. It just works every mm-hmm. single time. And I can tell people that until I'm blue in the face, but until they literally sit down and commit to it, they're not, they just won't see the results. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So 
Now, as a tradition, I am a huge foodie, which you, mm -hmm. um, Billings Lifestyle Magazine is located at the same, in the same building yep. as OMH Agency, which we're really happy about and excited about. So you know this about me, that I'm a huge foodie. Yes. It's very important to me. So um, at the end of Chat and Grow, I always ask, what is your favorite dish or ingredient? So... I'm a big fan of Mexican food, okay. but I've learned since getting to know you. and oh, sorry. That, <laughs> Speak that, freely. I won't judge you. You that, can say whatever you want. No, what I've I learned, might judge a little bit. We, no, don't, just... we don't have authentic Mexican food necessarily in Billings, and so uh, which is disappointing to me that I'm, I'm learning that all I like is our westernized, our Americanized uh, it's uh, like Mexican food. You the Easter Bunny's not yeah. real or something. <laughs> but I love I, I love Mexican food, and if I were to pick one specific thing. Um, that I like to try at every Mexican restaurant is their chimichanga. I like to see how okay. they create the chimichanga, you know, how they prepare it and they serve it. And oh, okay. So, that's so how do you like it prepared the best? Um, so far, so I know it's it's kind of a localized chain, if you will. I mean, we have one of them here. It's Rio Sabinas has got this oh, yeah. um, chimichanga that they do, and it's enchilada style. That, that's how they finish it off. It's good. Okay. It's good. So you like it kind of enchilada style. i got to stay away from it, though. Yeah, they're really... So, Gooey and yummy. But yeah, yeah, I just yeah. <laughs> and I'm starving, so I don't I think we should talk about this anymore. Time, so really hungry, <laughs> no, so that's that is something um, foodie wise that I, I really enjoy. So nice. Well, thank you again for coming and for sure. um, sharing. For me. I know budgeting is such a huge thing uh, with business owners and such. So if you are interested in any of these really great things we have happening. Uh, we are all over social media. You can contact us however you feel like. You can email us or message us on Facebook or comment. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So thanks again, Jeff. Yeah, I really thanks appreciate for having it. Me. This was a lot of fun. And um, thanks, Taylor. And thanks, Alex. Have a great day and the best is yet to come. Thanks. See you guys.